If you have your Bible, turn book of 2 Timothy chapter number 3 with me tonight. Verse number 10. 2 Timothy 3, 10. As you know, the Apostle Paul, uh, in the terms of endearment, called Timothy his son in the faith. And, of course, he meant by that that, that uh, Timothy was a disciple that had, that had uh, come into saving faith of Christ by the fact of his mother and grandmother's foundation he laid and then the preaching of the Apostle Paul. In 2 Timothy chapter number 3 and verse number 10, the infallible text says, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me, yes. yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Bless this holy book, Father, your book, your word. May you be glorified and honored tonight. In thy name we pray, amen. You can be seated. There are many wonderful and admirable things here the Apostle talked about that make up his, his uh, testimony. And these are things that all of them in their own right uh, need to be preached about. But I want to call your attention to one thing tonight from chapter number 3 and verse number 10 where the Apostle Paul said, You have known my manner of life. You know how I live. And that's important to understand that if his manner of life was not, uh, did not back up of what he preached, then his preaching is in vain. Amen. Now the Word of God is what begets you, but the problem is that so many people have turned off God's Word because of what they've seen in the lives of people who profess to be Christians. I preached in a church one time where I was told by the pastor of that church that uh, one of the former pastors in that church was up in the pulpit and said enough of this, and he went and took a woman by the hand that sat somewhere across the front of that building, took her by the hand and said, let's go. And they went out the back door, but the woman he took by the hand was not his wife. He left his poor wife sitting there in that congregation, and she went out into the streets of Knoxville, Tennessee, and essentially lost her mind. What a horrible thing. And it's my understanding that later on, why he continued on in the ministry and began to pastor somewhere else not me. Amen. He won't be my pastor. Amen. No, we all have our problems. Nobody's in this house perfect tonight. I do not pre preach perfection because I'm not perfect. But there is a time when you lose enough of your testimony where you no longer have any business in the pulpit Amen. trying to preach and teach to people and minister the Word of God. Right. And so it happens. And I have seen pastors that have been uh, prosecuted for alienation of affection a term that I'd never heard before in my life for having a number of affairs, one right after another. And these kind of things happen. As a matter of fact, they happen all too often. They happen everywhere. And that is your testimony. It's not all the stuff that comes out of your mouth. It's how you live your life. And you can't live a Christian life without the power of God. You can't do it. You just absolutely can't do it. Because if you could do it, it's a work of the flesh. And you can't do it. It's an impossibility. You need the power of God in your life to live a Christian life. Now, the world doesn't expect you to be perfect, but they expect you to be real. Amen. They're looking for reality. They're looking for something they don't have. They know you're a human being in the flesh. They know that you're not, uh, you know, that you're, you, you certainly are not an angel in that sense. They know that. But they expect you, if you're going to get up and preach to them, or you're going to try to witness to them, and you're going to try to get them saved, they expect to see something in you. So the Apostle Paul said, you have fully known my manner of life. I'm glad, thank God for forgiveness. I'm glad, thank God for forgiveness. I'm glad that if you have messed up, that God has made ample provision for you to make things right. Because he's already made them right. And all he expects you to do is to accept what he's done for you. 
We live in a generation, 2014, where people, uh, anything goes. Nothing matters today. And people shack up and people, uh, people abort their babies and people, uh, they, they approve of sodomite marriage and, yeah. and everything under the sun today. And it seems like there's nothing that's, uh, that's forbidden uh, anymore in this generation. And I wonder at 10 years from now, what's coming next? Because if they approve of sodomite marriage today, then how about bestiality tomorrow? Because it's coming down the road. And the North American Man-Boy Love Association, NAMBLA, you know, are pushing for uh, their, I think their motto is sex by six or sex by seven and it's too, or it's too late. Uh, yes, exactly. And for little children. And so we have people that are sitting in the judges' seats and are lawyers and doctors and, and movers and shakers in this country and around the world that are pushing for this gross conversion and that's exactly what's coming if something's not done to stop it. The good folks in North Carolina a couple of years ago, 2010, I think it was, somewhere in that area in that time, voted in the state of North Carolina to say that the only marriage in this state that we recognize is the marriage of a man and a woman, according to the Scripture. But it's my understanding that that's been thrown down now by some judge and that he's overturned the will of the people. And so much for this business about telling you that you need to go vote. If you go vote and you cast your vote on these amendments and so forth and so on, and then some judge comes along later on and overturns it, then he's making a mockery of the, ju of the, of the vote by the people. Amen. Amen. I want to put that in there for you tonight. He's making a mockery of your vote. He's telling you your vote doesn't matter. And just from my, while I'm on the subject, uh, last Tuesday, November the 4th, the vast majority of the American people that voted voted the Democrats out of office, and so far we've got six or seven new uh, senators or Republicans, and I think the state of Louisiana will surely go Republican because Mary Landrew is up against two, and once those two votes are brought together into one person, I don't believe she's going to be the, the senator from Louisiana much longer, and so it'll be the seventh or the eighth. I think it's the eighth uh, Republican uh, senator that the Republicans have picked up. Plus they picked up some in the House of Representatives. Plus they picked up governors in states like Massachusetts and places like that around the country that you least expected it. And so what's happening is that these, the, it's not that the country is waking up to morality. It is that the country is sick and tired of Barack Obama and his lawlessness. And then he gets up the next day after this election, November the 5th, and he holds a press conference and he gets up and tells these people, he says to them, like we are a bunch of stupid fools, he says to the people present, well, two thirds of the electric didn't show up. And the votes, votes that you had were only from about a third of the people. In plainer words, he said, I realize that the Democrats suffered a loss yesterday, but if all these people out here had come to vote, that are, that are our people, our constituency, that I would have been put, uh, then we would not have had this happen to the Democrat base. But the bottom line is, maybe they did vote by not voting. Yes, maybe they voted by not voting to send a clear message to Barack Obama that they're ready to stop him however possible. And the reason I'm saying this to you tonight is because there may be a ray of hope in what's coming when the new Congress is sworn in in January that we have been praying for for a long time. Yeah. And just the other day in Houston, Texas, the lesbian mayor of that town had put these preachers under notice that she wanted their sermons. She wanted to, she was crossing the line big time. Yeah. But she had no idea of the hornet's nest that she was about to stir up. And she stirred one up, believe me. And not only did the preachers and the Christians in Texas come against that, but all across the nation. And she shut up and backed down. And I'm glad she did. What does that say? That says if you want your freedom of speech, if you want your freedom to preach, if you want your freedom to meet that, that this nation has enjoyed for 200 years, you're going to have to fight for it. You're going to have to do something because there's an element out there that will take your freedoms away from you. Believe me, they will. They'll take them away from you. Every time you see a bumper sticker that says coexist, 
Think about the fact that the one driving that car with that bumper sticker that says coexist has no concept whatsoever about what freedom of speech means. What these people are saying is that you either march to my tune or you shut up. I believe that the lesbian, the sodomite, the Democrat, the Republican, the communist, the Muslim, all of them, if they are American citizens, have the same right of freedom of speech that I do. As an American citizen, the Constitution gives them that right. And I have no intention of trying to take their right to speak away from them. None. As American citizens, we either let them all speak or nobody speaks. So they have that right to speak. And along with that, they need to leave us alone. And I'm not talking about inciting to riot. I'm not talking about inciting to overthrow the government. I'm not talking about a Muslim mosque when you've got an imam up there teaching them to go out and blow people up and kill people. That has nothing to do with freedom of speech. But they have a freedom and a right to get up and preach their doctrine all they want to. And the sodomite can get on radio and say whatever he pleases. And that is America. Don't you want it that way? Amen. That's what the Bill of Rights is about, folks. And the very first amendment to the Bill of Rights is the freedom of speech. If you take their freedom of speech away from them, they can take yours away from you. So to the lesbian mayor in Houston, Texas, learn a lesson. You cross the line. When you thought that because you were the mayor, you could shut these preachers up and shut up people that criticize sodomy, and you're going to criticize sodomy if you're going to preach the Bible. That's right. That's right. You're going to criticize so-called same-sex marriage. Amen. If, you're going to, if you're going to preach the Bible, you're going to criticize this stuff. And if you get the people in office that start passing hate speech and hate crimes, and then it's left up to them to define what this is all about, they will come for you and they will shut you up and close your Bible and close your church doors. Amen. If the Internal Revenue Service, and I don't think there's anybody in this house tonight that has any faith in the IRS. When Lois Lerner got up in front of those people and pleaded the Fifth Amendment, she let them know, I'm not telling you anything. But by pleading the Fifth Amendment, she said, I'm guilty of sin. The Internal Revenue Service issues to churches what's called a 5013C, which is a tax-exempt status by the federal government. Now here's the problem with anything the federal government gives you. It has strings attached. So if the federal government is going to give a church a 5013C classification, tax exempt, they're also going to step into your church houses and tell you what you can preach and what you can't preach. And that is freedom of speech that has been violated by the IRS. So the Republicans are not your savior. No way under the sun. But friend, you saw which direction the Democrats were leading you. Maybe God will move in the midst of what's coming up. I like the senator from Iowa. I like her. Jody Ernst. She says, I, I was raised up on a hog farm. I know all about pigs. And when we get to Washington, we're going to make them squeal. <laughs> She says, and I know how to cut pork. I'd love to have her as a senator here in Tennessee, brother. <laughs> I'd, like to I'd like to have Mr. Alexander and Mr. Corker talk like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I like her spunk and her attitude. Now, let's see what happens when they're sworn into office. Yeah. Amen, amen, amen. amen. Yeah. I'm going to talk to you tonight about the rock that cannot be moved. In the book of Daniel, it says that I saw a stone cut out of a mountain. This stone that was cut out of a mountain was a great kingdom. It smote the image on its feet. The image was an image that Daniel's uh, king had seen and could not interpret. And Daniel gave the interpretation. And Daniel told them, he said, now let me tell you what this image is all about. And he told them that four successive world kingdoms would follow, one after another. Yeah. Babylon. Medes and the Persians, the Grecians, then the Romans, split into two sides, two legs. 
degenerate down to the feet, clay mixed with iron, which does not mix. Once it had reached that point, a stone cut out of a mountain would smite the image on its feet. When it smites the image on its feet, the whole image collapses. The whole Gentile structure comes tumbling down. The wind blows it away. And in those days, the Bible says, the Lord God will raise up a kingdom that will be an everlasting kingdom that shall never see an end. The stone that is cut out of that mountain is not Peter. It's not me. And it's not the church. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the chief cornerstone. Now you can't, how many times do you ever hear the word cornerstone sung by somebody up here in this pulpit? It's so rare that you hardly ever hear it. And then Debbie McLeod gets up here a few minutes ago and she's singing about the cornerstone. And I thought to myself, God has done this so many times, so many times that he gives me a message and then he'll confirm it in song before I ever get up to preach it. I'm going to talk about that stone. That's the cornerstone. The cornerstone is a very important stone. Say, so why is it important? Because none of the rest of the stones know where to go until you've got the cornerstone. The cornerstone marks the beginning and the direction of the building. You've got to get the cornerstone right or none of the others will be right. When the cornerstone is placed, you have one wall going in this direction and another wall in that direction. Some say that the ancients would always place the cornerstone at the northeast corner when the building was to be built. North, of course, is where the sides of the north is located, where God Almighty's throne is located. East is where he's coming from. As the lightning shineth in the east and you see it in the west, so shall it be with the coming of the Son of Man. So therefore, fixed at the northeast corner, it establishes the reference to the coming of the Lord God himself. Amen. And it is the stone that the builders rejected in the, book of, uh, in the New Testament because the builders, of course, were the Jews setting about to build their own kingdom without virtue of the Lord Jesus Christ. They rejected him. And by rejecting him, they reject his kingdom. You can't have the kingdom without the king. The problem with the world is it wants the kingdom, but it doesn't want the king. The world wants the blessing, but it doesn't want the blesser. The world wants to enjoy the pleasure, but it doesn't have, gives, no, gives no credibility or no appreciation for the one who gives us the pleasure and the blessing. All good things flow forth from the Lord God himself. Yet man sets about to enjoy the fruits of these things without paying acknowledgement to God himself. This is why when this brother got up here tonight and sang about being thankful, that is a truth, folks. That is an absolute truth. If you cannot be thankful, you will never appreciate where it comes from. Amen. The world thinks its hands, thinks its ability, its wit, and, and, and therefore, and therefore, and therefore, uh, it says to itself, I did this by my hands. I prospered by my hands. I am where I am because of hard work. But I am where I am tonight by the grace of God. And I am who I am tonight by the grace of God. And God feeds me, put food on my table and clothes on my back. And remember this, folks, your heart could not beat. You could not breathe. You could not think. You could not live without the grace of God. And so I thank him tonight. I am thankful tonight. I am so thankful tonight because I know where I could be were it not for the grace of God. Here's some things I want you to look at. I want you to notice how, first of all, this building is built that we're talking about. He starts with raw material. If you're going to build a building, you're going to use raw material. He made alliance, Solomon did, with Hiram, the king of Tyre in the north. Hiram had a lot of cedar trees up there. He would cut the tree down they would drag it out to the Mediterranean Sea, put it on barges, and carry it down to be taken to build the, the temple there of Solomon. And my friends, the archaeologists have found the very spot where, the, where these huge trees were drugged through the dirt and loaded onto the barges. Don't you think that's remarkable? This happened not too long ago. And then the stones that were placed into that temple were cut out of a quarry, and all of the work was done on spot, in situ, there where the stone was cut, it was formed. The master mason that did that had to know what he was doing because this stone had to fit. He couldn't make it fit once he got it to the site. And this is the way things are built, folks. An evolutionist has never built anything. 
A man that sits in his ivory palace with his PhD books has, does not have a clue what it takes to build something. If he ever did, he'd stop being an evolutionist overnight. When you drag a stone out like that and take it to a wall and put that stone in that wall and it needs just a little bit of adjustment here, you need to shave a little bit off of the corner. You know, you've got to make it fit. You can't do that. According to the Old Testament, when they built that temple, every bit of that was done where they quarried the stone. Not a sound of a pick or an ax or anything could be heard. It was all done on the spot. And so when they put it in the wall, it was already ready. And when they put me in the wall, I was already ready. And I'm so glad to God tonight that he didn't inquire of the church. He didn't inquire of people. He didn't ask anybody's permission. He didn't ask if I would fit. He said, you're in. Yep. And here's something else I believe, and I've never had a problem with this since I've been born again. I've never had a problem with Christians accepting me into the body of Christ. They may not like some things about me, but if I'm truly born again, they're going to accept me, and the same for you. If you are truly born again by the grace of God, you don't have to please people to be accepted. You don't have to conform to what they think you ought to conform to. If you have truly been queried from that pit, dug, cut from that rock, and therefore you have been fashioned to be put in that wall, nobody's going to have to tell you exactly what you ought to be like. The Holy Ghost will take care of that part. Amen. I'm glad that we're fitly framed together. I'm glad. A big mistake that's made in the church is when pastors spend all their time micromanaging the Christians and telling them every move to make and exactly how to live. That's a shame. I'd like to say to that pastor, son, you got a problem. You don't believe the Holy Ghost is able to clean these people up and tell them how they ought to live and where they ought to be and what they ought to look like? You let the Holy Spirit get in a woman's soul and you'll watch her start putting clothes on. You let the Holy Ghost get in a man's soul and you watch his eyes. They'll get, uh, you know how they wander around. Men have problem with eyeball problem. You watch those eyes start being fixed on the ones he ought to be fixed upon. And some of the stuff that he's watching, he'll stop watching. You let the Holy Spirit start working on a man's heart. He will do far more to sanctify that individual than we ever could do. And that's what we want. Don't you want the Holy Spirit to do it? and not you. And so he takes raw material. Did you know that where they quarried the stones for the temple, you can go underneath the temple mount, you can find places where they quarried them, and you can see where the stones were cut out, and you can also see certain stones. And they showed me this one time when we were there. The, the, the guide said, now see some of these stones? I said, yeah. He said, some of these were quarried to be put in the temple of Solomon, but they didn't use them because there was a problem with them. I thought, man, that'll preach. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way preachers are. Anytime you run up on anything, boy, that'll preach. <laughs> you know, constantly looking for something and maybe not even looking for it, but the fact is that it just jumps out at you. You see, God started with you. and You might be in this house tonight and the Holy Spirit convicted you and began to draw you and you had something good and real begin to happen in your life. For the first time in your life, you got your eyes off people and they were pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. and something stopped. Somewhere you came up short and you didn't make it and now you're miserable because you know you don't have what God intended to do for you. How many of you know what this brother's talking about when he says he gets down over here and for those months that he went, three months, he didn't have any fellowship with God. I mean, is this just all emotion? I mean, what's he talking about? Fellowship with God, what's that? I mean, is that a reality? I mean, you can have God moving, you can have God in your life? Yeah. Where when you pray or when you live out the day, you feel something, you know something, not just feel it, you just know it. If you're born again, you know what he's talking about. You certainly do. But you let him get up and say that in a lot of these churches in Knoxville, Tennessee, and they wouldn't have a clue what he's talking about. They don't know what he's talking about. Why they don't know? Because they don't know the Lord. But you can know the Lord. He's no different than any of the rest of us. Christ tasted his death, my death, your death. He bore my sins, his sins, your sins in his body on the tree. I think that's one of the greatest messages to get across to people is the fact that I don't care who you are, what you've done, he died for you. Hallelujah. So he starts with raw material. It's not what the material looks like. It's what the man who, it's what the master looks like. It's not, it's, not, it's not so much where it comes from. It's the fact that it's in the hands of the one who knows what he's going to do with it. Amen. Some of you came from circumstances far different from mine. 
before you were born again, you might have lived in a, in a good, godly, clean home and a mother and a father that, uh, that prayed with you and read the Bible with you. And you who are under Christian influence as far back as you can remember in your life. If that's true, if that's the way you were raised, thank God for it. That's the way it ought to be. Amen. Amen. That's the way it ought to be. This is what he's talking about in Timothy. He said, from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, able to make thee wise into salvation. Timothy had been taught the Bible for as far back as he can remember. Good. But all of us didn't come up like that. And you think sometimes, well, I'm a second-class person. You know, I'm, I'm not worthy or I'm not as good as so-and-so. And that's why you don't hear anything out of me and you never will about talking about who's good and who's better than this one and better than that one. And get somebody up here on this stage and say, now this is the example you need to be. That's the problem. When God saved you, he saved you. Amen. There's not another one of me on the earth. Amen. Did you get that? Hallelujah. Just one. That's all the earth can handle. I don't want you to be me. I don't want you to be me. You can't be me. I'm me. I've got my past. I know where I came from. I know what I am. I know what all that came together to make me what I am. And when God saved me, he put me in that wall. Yeah. He put me there because he loves me. He had a place for me. Yeah. I can minister to certain people. Yeah. Some people I cannot minister to. I have a hard time ministering to self-righteous people. Yeah. I really do. I have a hard time. But I've noticed that the preaching that I preach for that old sorry, low-down, scumbag dog that got drug up out of the pit, that's been stomped on and treated like a dog all of their life, when they hear me preaching the Word of God for somehow or another, it seems to get through. It seems to get through. And so that's who I'll minister to, whoever God wants me to minister to. You make a great mistake when you take a bunch of young men, try to, try to teach them about the ministry and about ministering, and take them and stamp them out like cookie cutters, where they all have to be the same. No, sir, friend. No, sir. That's not my place to mold you. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's very important. Amen. Amen. I had a long time before I finally learned the lesson. I'm not a book writer, but I read books. Believe me, I read them. But I'm not a book writer. I'm not a songwriter. A lot of things that are in the body of Christ, I don't do. So what do you do, preacher? I'm a preacher. And I'm fully comfortable in that. That's my calling. And then he also called me to teach, to study, and, and put it out in a way to where people can understand it, to where they've learned something. Not get up in front of people, and I will see so many of these guys do this. They get up in front of you and they try to impress you by using a bunch of uh, 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 words and stuff just to impress. Well, what's the point? Pump up your ego? You haven't helped anybody. Teach them. One of the things of a bishop is that he's apt to teach. So those are the two things I know my calling. He didn't call me to be a missionary. I respect missionaries. We support missionaries. Thank God for the good missionary. But he didn't send me to the mission field. He called me to pastor a church, preach the word, open the Bible, and teach it. I am at peace Amen. with that calling. Amen. You go to the prisons, don't you, brother? Amen. You got something in your soul that ministers to prisoners. You know how they think. You know what they're thinking about. You know how to reach them. Amen. That's your ministry. I can't do what you can do. You've got your place in the wall, in the body of Christ. He formed you, fashioned you, molded you. He did. And then when the day came, he put you into the ministry. Amen. That's the way it works. Right. Amen. Do you know your place? Do you know your calling? Make your calling and election sure. The raw material in the hands of the master is all he needs. Amen. That's all he needs. That's good. And here's the second thing I want to talk about to you tonight. He applies the master's touch. He does it. I'm not God, and it's not my place to take the place of God. I heard about a pastor one time who had a huge church, and he, they said that he had lined, people lined up, uh, hundreds of people when the service was over with, because he told everybody in that church who to marry, when they would get married, this, that, this, that, he got into every detail of their life as if God Almighty had chosen him to be the one to tell them 
all these things, personal and private, about their lives. I'm so glad to the Lord God I don't have that burden. Amen. I've heard these guys get up and they talk about, well, now you need to be compatible. If you're going to get married to somebody, you have to have common interest. You have to, you have to, you know, you have to understand each other. You, you just have to, you, they got this list, this long list about all this stuff that makes a happy marriage. You need to date for at least a year or two years and really get to know each other. My wife told me the other day, said if I got to know you, I would have married you. <laughs> said it won't work out. That was 46 years ago. In 46 years since we've been married, I've known a lot of people that have been married and divorced, been married and divorced, been married and divorced yeah. since we met. Yeah. It's not because we're compatible. It's not because we like the same thing. Most of the stuff she likes, I don't like. <laughs> Most of the stuff that interests her bores me to tears. <laughs> and the stuff that interests me bores her to tears. I'm trying to say this to you tonight. Because young people have been fed a lie. That's right. That's right. It's like you can punch all this stuff into a computer, yeah. and then that computer is going to, and then it's going to print out something to tell you, well, this is the kind of person you need to be looking for. You know the matchmakers on, on the Internet and the TVs and all of that? And, uh, and we put people together and they stay together. No, God puts you together. Right. And God put us together before I even knew him. He separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. And 46 years ago in 1966, December the 9th, 1966, we stood together in a living room of a house and I took her by the hand and Fern D. Robinson got up in front of us and opened up the Bible and said some words over us and I took her to be my lawfully wedded wife yeah. in 1966. And friend, I'm going to tell you tonight, I'm more married now than I was in 1966. Yeah. She's part of my bone, part of my yeah. flesh, part of my soul, Amen. part of my very being. Amen. And that grows over time. Yeah. And that's the way your marriage ought to be growing. Sure is. It ought to be growing like that. Yeah. And it becomes one of the most blessed, gracious things in the world. Yeah. But you can't say to Preacher Lawson, well, I want my marriage to be like your marriage. No, you don't. Because you're not me and the ladies are not her. There, I don't believe there are any two marriages exactly alike. Wow. So most of this stuff that you hear from the experts is a lot of garbage. Right. Wow. Here's what I tell people when I try to counsel with them back here in this office. Make your marriage work. Make it work. And it'll work. You're going to have to give some. She's going to have to give some. Make it work. And if you're willing to do that, you can have a marriage. Amen. Here's the third thing. He places each piece as he desires. But he does this on a foundation. The Lord Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone of that foundation. I want you to keep in mind that the building is not hung out in the middle of air. The building has a foundation. The Bible says the apostles and prophets are that foundation. But the Lord Jesus is the chief cornerstone. He, therefore, is the alignment that the prophets, that the apostles all line up to. Amen. These stones that are placed in that wall are all, in other words, they relate to the one cornerstone. Uh, the idea is, well, if the cornerstone is set in this, in this angle, in this vicinity, in this place, then we've got to be there in the same place in order to relate to this stone. It's not just scattered around like you throw seed on the ground. And the building is built like that. Everything relates to the Lord Jesus Christ. So if I were the devil, what would I do if I wanted to destroy the building of God? I would confuse you as to who the Lord Jesus Christ is. That's what I'd do. I'd confuse you to his ministry, his identity, and who he is and what he's about. The Son of God, folks, is what we are built upon. We're built upon his sacrifice, his word, his person, his love for us, who he is to the Father, who we are to the Father through the Son. All these are great truths. And everything that a Christian is, is based upon who the Lord Jesus Christ is to God the Father. Amen. 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 Everything we are is based upon who Christ is to the Father. And who is Christ to the Father? Who's the Lord Jesus to the Father? He's his son. And there's none greater than his son. 
He loves His Son with a love that He doesn't have for anything else. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He said to the Father in John chapter number 17, He said, Father, I return to you because I came from you. And while I was in this world, I kept all of them and lost none save the son of perdition. And he said, I'm going back to you, Holy Father. And he said, now when I go back to you, I'm leaving my believers and my brothers here in this world. Keep them, keep them like I have kept them. And that promise of John chapter number 17 is for every one of us, all of the believers in this house tonight. He's going to keep you. He that hath begun a good work in you will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. Else you go to the building and here are the stones. Here's the foundation, one row upon another. And you walk up to the building and you look at it and you say, my, there's a stone missing here. What happened to that stone? Did somebody come and take it out of the wall? You, for example, you were put in that wall. But if you can lose your salvation, there's going to be a big hole where you used to be. Every stone fitly framed together. Amen. And folks, listen to me. When Herod built his temple, you go look at that temple. It's no longer there, but the retaining wall is there. The walls underneath the ground are there. There's no mortar. The stones are just laid one upon another. They've been laying there for 2,000 years. They're not, you know what mortar does. There's no mortar. Now, what do you think is going to happen to a structure when you start pulling stones out? It's going to collapse because those stones support other stones. The row above it is supported. If the church of God can just lose members, and lose their salvation, and be taken out of that wall, that wall will collapse. Yeah. And he said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen. You may think that a certain believer is a lowly believer that's really not all that necessary to the body of Christ. And that's the attitude of so many arrogant, smart aleck people in the church. They get that attitude. They really do. They get that idea. And what you don't realize is that you don't know anything about who that person is and where that person fits in that wall, and how right. God's put them in the body of Christ. Right. If you are a born-again believer tonight, you've got a reason for being who you are and where Amen. you are. Amen. And according to the Scripture, I need you. Yeah. Amen. I need you. That's right. I need you. And you need me. Amen. Go home and read 1 Corinthians 12. Read it carefully. Mm -hmm. And the Apostle Paul tells him plainly, one part of the body says to another part of the body, I don't have need of thee. But the fact of the matter is we all need each other. Right. We're interconnected. We need each other. Yeah. Fitly joined together. And then finally, <coughs> he creates an atmosphere for his father. What is that, preacher? That's what so many of the churches today are lacking. They got a lot of good people in them. No doubt in my mind, a lot of these people out here are sincere people. I'm not the judge of the whole earth. It's not my place. I don't want that burden. I can't do that. God's the only one that can judge the motive and the heart of an individual. God's the only one that can do that. I can't do that. I don't have any business trying to do that. I'll leave that to Him. But I'll tell you this. God does not come into this house because it's loud. It makes a lot of noise. He doesn't come into this house because we can hang a bunch of stuff on the walls and decorate it up and please the flesh. He doesn't come into this house because of who we are or we have some great speaker come in here or some Christian celebrity. God comes into this house because His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, exalted and glorified and magnified Amen. in this house. How does that happen? All these stones are covered with wood. But it's not left with wood, then they're covered with gold. When you walked into the Temple of Solomon, if you were privileged to walk into the Temple of Solomon, and only the priest and the high priest could do that, you walked into the temple, inside the building itself. When you saw the wall, it was pure gold. So what did you see? You saw deity. You saw deity. 
And that's what we see here if Jesus Christ is glorified. Amen. All of His perfections, all of His glory, all of His majesty, all of who He is. If that takes place inside a building, God the Father walks right into that building Amen. and it becomes a habitation of God by the Spirit. Amen. We've got to learn that lesson, folks. We've got to learn to exalt Christ and not each other and ourselves. Amen. Exalt Christ. Amen. Our testimony, like you heard a minute ago, our testimony should be, look what God has done in my life. Look what He's done and what He'll do for you. And that's the kind of testimony that puts more gold on the walls. I want to see more gold on the walls. I want to see less wood on the walls. Not the humanity, but the gold. More gold on the walls. The wall itself is not supported by the wood and it's not supported by the gold. The wall itself is supported by the fact that it is a piece of stone yeah. cut out of the ground, but it's covered by gold. If we look at each other as born again believers washed in the blood yeah. of the Lord Jesus Christ, we all are on equal ground. Amen. Our footing is the same. We can fellowship with each other. If we come into this house and begin to nitpick, pick and nitpick each other, then we can pick each other to death and consume each other. And what do you think the Holy Ghost is going to do in God the Father? He has nothing to do with that crowd. That's right. They believe all the right things, but they are at each other's throat. Right. And the reason they are is because they are pumped up themselves, yeah. puffed up their ego. How big I am, how great I am. I haven't done what you've done. I've been clean where you were out and where you were wrong and where you were gone. And it's the idea of, look who I am. Well, who, look who you are. Let the man that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. You take a bunch of people with humility covering their soul. You've got gold everywhere. And then you have the presence of God. That's what I want here. The presence of God. Father, I pray that you'd use what I've said tonight. And I pray for everyone that heard it. I pray we'd take it to heart, Lord. It's not about me. It's not about us. It's about thee. And may you be glorified in Jesus' name. For Jesus' sake, I ask it and I pray it. Amen. All right, let's stand up tonight.